It is probably around 4.30, quarter to five, on a Thursday in the city, Nairobi's favorite evening, I think, <laughs> or oh, I've had. Thursday is the new Thursday. But this ledge, this is probably like one of the best views that you can get from this building, if not the best, right? So Banda Street is right in front of us. We're on a high ledge on what is the second, f the first floor? the first floor of the building and you've got these like columns really really massive beautiful columns six of them in total and then you look outside there are all these cars people walking around we've got a new restaurant right across and then all the way straight down is the Supreme Court which is quite a lovely thing actually to see from here it's beautiful to watch the city like people just kind of walking past the library, not seeing it, the way that we all <laughs> didn't see it, like, look, we're here, we're here. It's just being like, not even taking a beat to like, hey, yeah, what's this? Like, no curiosity at all. Well, someone just walked in. Yeah. We converted one person. People watching from the upstairs balcony of the Macmillan Memorial Library is one of my favorite things to do. But quickly, we end up looking upwards as well, towards the roof. It's a particular kind of molding, no? This, right? Like lime, some kind of. Anyway. You know what's curious is that it hasn't rained in so long. So why is like is this the water damage from the time it rained for two weeks all those months ago? Because like it, it, it means that there must be some water is collecting. Or water damage. Hi, and welcome to A Palace of the People. My name is Manjiro Koinange. And I am Angela Washuka. Today's episode, A Palace Needs a Roof. So back to episode one. We explored the origins of the Macmillan Memorial Library and the man it was built in honor of. Go back and listen if you haven't had a chance to yet. But to catch you up, this library was built by Lady Lucy Macmillan as a memorial to her late husband, but it's one thing to decide to build a memorial and another to build a massive building in the middle of town in 1930. We know little about the original designs behind the building or even the architect's name. Some sources say that A.C. Rand Overy was behind the building and others credit John Sinclair, a British architect whose colonial era work is found mostly in Zanzibar. We'll get more into that later on. But first, the building. Whoever it was that designed the building, their aim was to impress because this building is very grand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it has these marble pillars and a 50-foot ceiling. Somebody was not playing. Mm -mm. So the Macmillan Library broadly fits into the classical category of architecture um, and it so classical meaning that it draws on Roman and Greek forms originally um, and there are particular features of this which we see very prominently on this building but which um, are common um, across the world. Particular ways of um, often very symmetrical buildings and uh, we may also often see a central feature as a focus. The origins of classical architecture were uh, set down by Vitruvius um, in, in the classical era and then Palladio in uh, the 16th century. In, in Okay, so this is Dr. Sarah Longair. I'm a senior lecturer in the history of empire at the University of Lincoln in the UK. I study East Africa and Indian, the Indian Ocean in the imperial era, mainly in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And I have particular interests in visual and material culture and architecture. Dr. Longair says that this kind of architecture classical architecture was very popular in Britain and its colonies. So you see many buildings, uh, particularly country houses in the 18th century and 19th century in Britain built in that style. So that creates what's called the neoclassical era. And then uh, these forms are then redeployed as the empire expands. Um, there's a particular preference for the classical within British imperial architecture partly because of its reference back to Rome. Um, and Britain in the 19th century is presenting itself as the new Rome. 
And while self-styling themselves as the, the new Romans, the British built a whole lot of buildings, not just in Kenya, but in Ghana, India, and Australia. Buildings were essential to their version of the empire. Whether that was for infrastructure, building post offices, railway buildings, offices, the administration of empire. But then you also have the more performative, monumental buildings, places like museums, uh, libraries, and these much grander um, uh, buildings, which had a particular function in presenting an image to colonized people, but also to the colonizer. Um, and I think in my research, I've particularly discovered that um, a lot of this was about reinforcement for the British in their own mission. Um, is that they could come to certain places, they could arrive in Mumbai or New Delhi or uh, uh, Sydney um, and see the power of empire reflected. And so today you still see similarities in architecture from Nairobi to London. We saw this in Nottingham on our last visit to the UK when the world was still open. Uh, we saw a library that was a spitting image of the Macmillan in Nairobi. Dr. Longe became interested in the Macmillan Library while she was researching a British architect called John Sinclair. Sinclair is one of the architects whose name has come up as the architect of the library building. One of the architects? Yep. So now, like I said, we're not really sure who designed the library. The plans we found in the library have the name C. Randovery on them. At the um, opening of the library, one of the sources I found, the, the East African Standard reported that Lord Delamere, who was um, delivering the speech at the um, opening, and um, who said that he, he credited um, Rand Overy and the, the company of uh, Messrs Rand Overy and Blackburn, but noted that we and they were fortunate in receiving the assistance and suggestions of Mr. J. H. Sinclair, CMG, the late resident of Zanzibar. So that was in 1931. So I think as with all colonial histories and particularly colonial architectural histories, the, the evidence can be very fragmentary. And we really do have to look very closely and grab all these fragments to put together a story. But we may never know precisely whose contribution was what and who we can credit to whom. Particularly that facade, which was, you know, built with these intentions to impose order and um, to intimidate us to a certain extent um, and to uh, present power, it can be reformulated to present the power of knowledge, the power of understanding that's accessible to everyone. And that's what we want to do at Bookbank, what we are trying to do. But to make this building accessible to everyone, we have to keep it standing. And on this journey, we have been really lucky to be advised by architects and designers who specialize in restoring old buildings. And one of those architects is Balmoy Abe. Balmoy, do you remember when you first saw the building? The first time I met, I visited the uh, the Macmillan Memorial Library, uh, I would say, after asking family, uh, I would say it would be 1988, and uh, I was dashing between the National Archives and the Macmillan Library in search of some information that I needed for a project that I was doing in uh, in primary school at the time. Fast forwarding to, I guess, where my memory serves me best is. Uh, 1997, uh, there was a high school visit to the library. Um, and once again, the reasons for going to such a library was usually um, induced by a school. So it wasn't my, you know, it didn't, it didn't sort of fall in my own personal need. Um, but that then was revisited in 2012 or 2013, if I recall. I, you know, what also just took me aback was uh, walking in and seeing, you know, uh, citizens of Nairobi uh, using this uh, library. The silence, the excitement that I got from seeing people, you know, sort of reading and engaging uh, with uh, antiquity or um, old Pan-African novels, I think drew me once again even to even saying, okay, so let's start beginning to explore this space. And that kind of led me, you know, further into the next space. And I'm sure now uh, there's a question coming uh, with regards to the grand stairwell that leads upstairs. Before we take you all inside the library, let's talk about where it is. 
It wasn't just the way it was built that makes this library so grand. It's also the way it's positioned. From an urban perspective, the Macmillan Memorial Library, it's, a, it's got a very strong um, identity in terms of scale uh, to its community, in terms of um, sort of even aligning itself as a hierarchy of importance. Uh, I feel what's also very important is when you start to see how a series of um, banks and uh, hotels thus followed in terms of their placement um, and using the library almost as a pivot uh, to to signal sort of the importance or hierarchy, the development of contemporary Nairobi. The library, on the other hand, has a di direct vistas that lead you, you know, visually straight to the courts. You know, equally as important in terms of uh, uh, sort of defining you know, sort of the national state uh, and parliament not too far away, uh, the library definitely has a strong colonial uh, presence um, and its significance uh, within, you know, sort of the, the mapping of Nairobi at large. But um, if I could now probably sort of lead you into the space, which is, you know, very captivating with this, this large, I would even call it like a triple vaulted, double vaulted ceiling, it's, 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 it's very grand. Um, which allows for this sort of procession um, of, of not only just um, climatic uh, balance, but more importantly, sort of a, a space for sort of mental and therapeutic uh, uh, learnings and insights. You know, you sort of have to realize that spaces are equally designed not only to house for shelter, but openly uh, spaces that can even cause uh, um, sort of a manipulation in direction or guidance where thought gets sort of provoked that transition from that threshold you know leading you up this very grand promenade up the stairs into this even equally large opening sets sets, sets the premise of the stage uh, for what a library and the importance of such a library uh, um, was to house Like lots of Nairobi's early colonial buildings, the library was built from stone, thicker bluestone to be exact. Before the British invaded, Bamoy says that we all built with different architectural styles and materials, depending on the surrounding environment. Somebody from east eastern side of Kenya, you know, say the Akamba, would be building from clay and brick, which is straight from the soil. Someone maybe from uh, the coastal region uh, would be looking to use more of the limestone aspect of construction you know, using the ready available local materials. Um, somebody, you know, maybe from a, a more colder uh, upland mountain climate would be conducive closely to using timber. Which you can still see today. Oh yeah, for sure. But not really here in Nairobi. A lot of research that we're doing today uh, speaks of the influence uh, that um, I would say the British, the Indians uh, brought to Kenya in terms of construction. Uh, we have adopted a lot of these um, uh, these building technologies from from the colonial past, uh, from that era. And what is very telling about something like the Thika blue stone that has been used is how this is carried on from a behavioral standpoint. That you know African buildings now no longer um, take on the form of timber, uh, adobe, mud. You know, even as far as uh, clay. So, or dung for that, for that matter. So it's very interesting to see how there's become a national adoption of this building material as the one, as the sort of the unit for, you know, so propagating what construction or comfort looks like within shelter and settlement. Whether or not we start to say British colonial architecture had an impact in Kenya uh, and it wasn't positive, well, clearly, when you start to look at how we build and we measure our levels of comfort, it has an origin. So I think it's very, very important as an archive and a datum for us to understand whether you're going to try to take on the notion of erasing something that has wounded uh, a part of your history equally. I think it's almost, um, it's almost foolish to think that, uh, you know, such spaces can just be forgotten and erased um, at the snap of a finger.
All these aspects, the craftsmanship, the thicker stone, the design, it has meant that the library has survived for decades. But I think we've already said this a lot on this podcast. It's kind of not in the best shape. Exactly. When Kenya attained independence, the Macmillan Memorial Library was bequeathed to Nairobi under the care of the then Nairobi City Council. It was open to the public, to Nairobians, to us, for the very first time. This was a period when post-independent modern architecture had an aesthetic, popularly referred to as African modernism, and popular throughout the city and all of Africa, really. Buildings like the Kenyatta International Convention Center, commissioned in 1967. New, exciting, modern for the time. Yeah, because no one really wanted to build old-fashioned European buildings. They wanted something for a new era that didn't remind them of Britain's rule. And as the years went by, the library began to fall into disrepair. And, and it is not only Macmillan. All those old buildings that are now kind of uh, monuments, they all kind of suffered the same fate. But I think it was either due to the government in totality not uh, recognizing that these are monumental sites that need to be preserved. Jacob Ananda is Macmillan's chief librarian. You heard from him in our second episode. If maintenance could have been there, then these uh, buildings could serve. As you see, as much as uh, they, are, they are now kind of uh, having some challenges, they're very, the structures are very strong. The rooms are very usable, the building, it's only things that are, it's only maintenance, it lacks maintenance. So if that one is fixed, those buildings, if you go now to the National Archives, you go to the National Museum, they all kind of, the government pumped in a lot of money, and now they are up to, to the kind of uh, user-friendly and uh, to the expected uh, uh, use of a, of a building that is uh, recent to the standards of uh, any person who would like to visit it. And how does that make you feel, Jacob? Uh, very disappointing. Because here you are, and uh, you are unable to to make a place look its worth. Because I remember when uh, I was employed, it was usable. There were no leakages on the roof, but the population was not that big, and uh, the budgetary allocations there were well, things were flowing. I remember we could be we could be supplied with cleaning materials almost twice in a week. But a time came when getting them was an issue. You get them after two months, you have to improvise. Uh, the, the, the red tapes would uh, hinder those floor of materials. And then now when you come to the issue of uh, that building needs uh, a serious architect, needs a professional kind of approach to, to fix it. Yes, um, well, the Macmillan Memorial Library, uh, in my opinion, when the book bank took over the project, was definitely signaling a, a very authentic interest in our national heritage. Uh, and what that then did was it kind of opened dialogue around what the appropriate treatment would be for such a space. I think you know, what's very telling is that we need to be able to understand the differences between, you know, um, a variety of actions that can be taken on, on such a space. And what I mean by this, we, we have, you know, dialogue around preservation. We talk about rehabilitation. There's also two other words, restoration and reconstruction. Now, I think it's very important for me to make this very clear that, um, Matters of preservation is mostly a focus on maintenance of the building, um, where you come to repair the materials um, that already um, that already take on the original form um, of the of the existing structure. So I feel that um, you know preservation would have a ratio percentage as to the kind of works that would be taking place internally and externally, uh, whereas rehabilitation. Um, is more of um, an addition or an altering to the property. Um, and this is kind of like where you say, okay, well, we're looking to 
to meet um, the continuing needs and the changing use of the building. Uh, so rehabilitation is kind of an adaptive process. I think that's what's really key for me, the changing use. Although we may have flooding and water damage, we may also have some unspecified mold ghosts. And we do not have washrooms. We do not. Um, but this is a building that has stood for nearly 90 years, and we want to ensure that it keeps standing. So we can add Wi-Fi, upgrade the electricals, update the collection, add local art to the space. We are go-getters. We, 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 we reason together. The beauty is that we never gave up. Uh, we became the three musketeers. Them having very many ideas and big ideas that are out of this world. Uh, in the Macmillan Memorial Acts, it says libraries are supposed to be there for leisure. You can come to the library and just uh, improve your knowledge to get new ideas, to meditate. So a library is a place where it gives somebody solace. The society cannot do without a library. Thank you for listening to A Palace for the People. I am Angela Washuka. And I am Wanjiro Koinange. If you want to find out more about BookBank, visit our website at www.bookbank.org and join us next week for the next episode. We have something really special for you. This episode was produced by me, Wanjiro Koinange, Angela Washuka and Mae Francis. Sioka Mutonga is our lead researcher and our resident queen of fact-checking. To support or donate to our work, please visit bookbank.org. You can also find learning resources to go along with this episode at bookbank.org forward slash podcast. This podcast is supported by the British Council, with special thanks to Balmoy Abe, Sarah Longer, and Jacob Ananda. And this week, we leave you with Della's version of Kenya's national anthem. Enjoy! Come